Hi everyone, thanks for joining us this evening for the Venture Center Learning Series sessions on business etiquette. What is business etiquette and why is it important? Business etiquette is a set of unwritten rules that apply to professional workplaces and relationships. In the business world, good business etiquette means that you act professionally and exercise proper manners when engaging with others. You may think that etiquette is old fashioned in today's casual world, but if you do, you'd be wrong. This session was developed based on feedback from our entrepreneurs in residence who are our mentors, who are interacting with the Stevens Venture Center teams. These real world business people and professionals suggested that a primer on business etiquette would be very valuable as you build your businesses or join the business world in a job. Why is business etiquette important? Good business etiquette is a valuable skill set that will make you stand out from others, enhance your chances at success, or help you land your dream job. Good manners can mean the difference between success and failure in many aspects of your life. People like others who have good manners and are more likely to do business with them or invest in them than if they like you. In business, the relationships you build are critical. Establishing good rapport is significant if you want to progress your professional future, impress a potential boss, attract investors, or close a sale. The way to build positive relationships in the business world is by exercising good etiquette. So I'd like to introduce you to Janine Batista and Allison Macaron of the Stevens Career Center, and they'll be leading us through this very interesting and timely topic. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, we put together really what we think is a great presentation. And these are the items that we'll go through today. So we're First, I want to talk a little bit about the history. We understand that most of you are probably part of the millennial and gener generation um, Z generation. So we want to go through that because this is the first time in history where all five generations are working in the workforce and that you'll have interactions from baby boomers to traditionalists to um, maybe people that are in their teens. Then we'll go through what it takes to make a deal, go through some communication and meeting etiquette, dining etiquette, and then go through building your network. So these are the generations. So quick overview, because I don't want to go too much into detail, but if you take a look at the screen, you have traditionalists who were born in 1922 to 1945. So these are um, the generations where they value hierarchy traditionalists, they really respect the chain of command, and they're loyal to the companies that they've worked for. Then you have the baby boomers who, before the millennial generation, they were the largest generation in the workforce. And they're focused, they're competitive, they have that forever young attitude. So although most of the traditionalists may have retired already, the baby boomers are still in the workforce especially after the 2008 financial crisis, many of them have postponed their retirement, um, so you may be interacting with them um, much more. Then you have Generation X, which is sandwiched between the two largest generations, so baby boomers and mill millennials. So these are the, the people that um, are independent, tech pioneers, so they've really ventured out, started Silicon Valley, they may be your entrepreneurs and residents, people that you're going to, um, to ask for investments and your angel investors. Then you have the millennials, which are self-expressive, group-oriented, they're tech-dependent, so they grew up in the technology boom. Um, and then sometimes they have that, I guess, um, view that they're self-entitled, um, but it's, all, it's a matter of perspective. Then you have Gen Z. So many college students starting their first year, second years are part of Gen Z. So they're technology advanced. They grew up with that entrepreneurial spirit and they're the, the most diverse generation. In a study when they, they asked Gen Z high school students, 61% um, of them said they wanted to be entrepreneurs. So this is really, you're really seeing the differences between generations where Traditionalists have stayed in one company from when they graduated college or maybe not even go to college and start high school. 
worked there for 50 years through Gen Z where you're starting um, businesses right out of college, maybe in high school going into college. Then I wanted to go over technology and how it's really changed our psychology and the way we interact. A research study found that 10 to 11 hours are spent by U.S. adults consuming social media and consuming media from screens, televisions, tablets, computers, phones, um, and that's really led to a few psychological trends where, yes, you're socializing more, you're on Twitter, you are, you're engaging on Instagram, you're posting likes, Facebook, but there's more social isolation because you're losing that traction of physical and emotional relationships. So that brings me to emotions. Many times maybe you'll say LOL, LMAO, or use emoticons to express your happiness. But when you're starting a company, you're not gonna send an email saying, all right, we're gonna get motivated, exclamation point, party hat, champagne bottle. Your team's gonna need you there. They wanna see you get excited. They wanna see you in the office. They wanna see you in your room. Um, and motivating them because they need to feel your emotion, that you're as excited as they are to build your business. And investors also want to see you as excited. You can't tell your story as effectively through a text or through an email, but more effectively in person. And then I really want to cover conversations and ghosting. How many of you have heard of the term ghosting? Some have. I know when I was growing up, ghosting didn't exist. I don't know if that was... Yeah. Ghosting did not exist. So does anyone want to tell me what ghosting is? When you're having a conversation with somebody mm -hmm. through a text message or something, you just somehow cut off replying to them and then right. don't send back any texts anymore. Yes. They can't get back. Yeah, so you're having a really great conversation. It may be through your personal relationships, but then something goes wrong and you stop talking to them. And we're seeing that in business as well from, from our students, and we both work at the Career Center, where students will be speaking with an employer or professional and then not respond to them because they don't know what to say or they're not interested in the opportunity. But knowing how to decline an opportunity, knowing how to ask for more time and ask for more information is just as important as knowing how to respond um, in a positive way. So we don't want to ever ignore an investor, ignore a partner, and we certainly don't ever want to ghost anyone. And that starts with your personal relationships, going to your business relationships. So what does it take to make a deal? First, who here wants to start their own business? OK. Who wants to have a full-time job? <laughs> OK. So really, the point is, no matter what you want to do, uh, the same techniques are involved with any relationship, because making a deal is really based on the relationships that you do make. Um, so again, strong relationships, and this is where I think the if you consider the different generations that you'll be working with, this is where that really comes into play because people see that differently, especially with professionalism. So you want to be professional, that could mean something different to you than it does to me, than it does to um, somebody who's 65, right? And you need to take that into consideration with everybody that you're working with. So you might think, okay, it's fine to just send a quick text to my boss, I'm not going to make it in but they see that as something that's really rude and they're not gonna take you seriously from then on out. And so that's really important with establishing relationships, knowing how to communicate, when to communicate, how often, how do they prefer it, and kind of how to build those relationships specifically. So this is really big about relationships. And I know that Janine mentioned this earlier, but having a positive attitude makes a huge difference. So she talked about telling your story. How do you get investors involved and want to invest in you? Well. That's exactly it. They, they should want to invest in you. So if you have a positive attitude, they're going to fall in love with your story and therefore they're going to want to invest in you. And again, that goes further than just if you're trying to start your own business. It's if you're working with a boss, if you're working with a peer, if a professor. Um, there's so many different ways that this comes into play in being a professional and you want to demonstrate that you are professional in any and every capacity. Um, and then clear communication, I think, comes into play as well. So considering all of the different channels of communication, how can you clearly communicate with each different person that you are communicating with? Um, so a really important part of professionalism is considering first impressions. Now, 
you think, okay, three to seven seconds is when somebody's gonna make a first impression of you. But that could be the three to seven seconds that they see you from across the room. And how are you um, maintaining yourself from afar, right? Because I might see you back there and you then come up to me, but I saw you goofing off with something and now I'm not interested. Um, it could also be through email. Mm -hmm. So especially now as you're working with different people, your introductions are going to be online. And people are going to make judgments and get an impression of you based on how you communicate via email. So it has to be professional. You don't wanna just send the quick, hey, what's up, can we meet now? Um, it's, that's not gonna fly. So you wanna consider that at all times. Also, what you wanna consider is that first impressions aren't necessarily what you're saying. Um, it's how you look, it's how you're controlling yourself, and again, that positive attitude. So if you seem really excited about something, that's gonna make me wanna engage with you. Um, you wanna have a strong handshake and really introduce yourself, but again, it's, it's the attitude, right? If I came up to Janine and I was like, hi, I'm Allison. Hi, Allison. Or if I'm like, hi, hi. I'm Allison. <laughs> I mean, it's different, right? I know that that's extreme, but it's different, and you get a different feel and a different energy and different engagement level. Present yourself with confidence. Again, it's really that positive attitude. Um, and again, how you look and how you handle yourself. So have a good posture, have a strong handshake, and it might be something that you wanna practice with friends to make sure that it is strong, but that is a huge component of a first impression that somebody will make of you is the handshake. Dress appropriately. So that could mean different things for where you are based on the environment, right? So you, it may be a suit. Um, a suit in some circumstances may be a little overdressed. You really just want to kind of feel out the atmosphere and the environment and dress appropriately for that. And then pay attention to all of the details in your attire from your shoes, to your belt, to your pants, to your jacket, to anything that you're wearing. Um, you don't want to go overboard, you want to fit in with the environment. And then this is just a quote that we added from Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank. People want to do business with someone they like. If people like you, they're going to want to do business with you, and if they don't, you're going to have an almost unsurmountable obstacle to overcome. Um, and I think Adrian mentioned this too, people who like you want to work with you. Um, I know, so I was in consulting for a while before I came to um, higher education, and that is very true. So in working with clients, if they, if they like you, they're much more open to the ideas that you bring to the table. And, and if they don't like you, or maybe they don't like somebody that you're working with, um, if they get a bad feel from that, that creates a huge challenge in working with them going forward, right? So it's really, really, really easy to lose somebody's trust and really difficult to build that back up. So you just wanna get it from the beginning and maintain, maintain that relationship. So now you wanna go through communication. And the first is email. How many of you use email on a daily basis? How many of you check your email on a daily basis? Okay, good, if you're not checking it on a daily basis, you should be checking it when you wake up, probably midday and then probably towards the end of the day. Um, it's really important because sometimes it's time sensitive. So some of this may be very basic to you, but we want to go over it because we want to make sure that nothing is um, ever at a loss when you're communicating. So most of you should have a professional email address if you're starting companies, um, making sure that you're using something professional like first name at stevensventurecenter.edu. In the subject line, you want to always have something that's clear so when people are searching or people see it, they know that, okay, that's important. This is the proposal that I was asking for. This is the draft. This is the final version. We use that when we're sending PowerPoints, when we're sending proposals to make sure you can clearly see what the email is about. Now, there's a few fields that you'll see when you're writing your email. You have the two. You have two, um, carbon copy and BCC. So the two would be the person you're directing it to. So if I wanted to have Allison review my proposal, that's where I would put her name. But if I wanted to CC our director and maybe the two other people that were working on the team, that's something that we'd put on CC. BCC, blind carbon copy, means that the person you're sending it to is not seeing who, you, who that third party is. Um, and I'll usually use it if I want to make my director known about um, a sensitive information. Just want to copy her on it and make, giving her a heads up. 
Um, but these fields, you want to make sure that if someone, for example, a CEO, or maybe, maybe you have Elon Musk's um, personal email address, and you're sending um, an email to your entire uh, group that's of 50 people. Maybe you shouldn't send, put his email as CC because everyone is going to see his email and have that um, really popular um, and influential person's personal email address. That's when you would put it under BCC. So just make note of those. And if you have any questions, you have a resources here at Stevens to make sure that, um, you know, go to Adrian, come to the Career Center. We can make sure that you're not doing these uh, email faux pas. And then we just have a general um, a format of your email. Sometimes we'll see students jump straight to the question, saying, can you please review the proposal? But there's no background to it. So you want to make sure you're addressing it to whoever it is, dear Susie, and give a little bit, bit of background. You update the proposal with the changes you discussed from the meeting, and then include important points. So the startup costs were 100K, we rewrote the paragraph, so showing the steps that you made, the changes that you made, and then asking them or whoever you're emailing it to what you want from them. So please review it, maybe give a timeline, if time's, time's really important, and letting them know, please let me know if you have any questions. And then always make sure you have a signature. So sometimes I know students here usually just write their full name, but you also want, maybe want to include the position, the company that you're in, your major, um, and what degree program you're, you're uh, pursuing. So hopefully by tomorrow morning, all of you will have a signature written in your email. So anytime you respond to email, it's already there and you don't have to retype it. And there's ways to do that via Gmail or whichever um, platform you're using. So how many of you think twice before you press reply, reply all, forward? Okay, all right, that's pretty good. Um, you should be, if you didn't raise your hand, definitely think about it because you want to use reply and reply all as needed. A lot of times um, people will reply all to distribution lists. So you may be replying to 750 people just to say, no, I can't make this event. And then people are gonna get annoyed because there's a chain going on and now you're getting 50 plus emails saying, no, I can't make this event. So um, just really consider the context of hitting reply versus reply all. Um, now also consider if somebody is, maybe you email somebody that you're trying to get invest, to invest in your company. And when they reply, they add two or three extra people on in the CC. That's likely for a reason. So you wanna consider replying all to that because the point of them, including them on the email, was to loop them in, right? They want them involved in the conversation, so you should continue that so that it doesn't feel like you're actively trying to exclude people. So just be aware of the reply versus reply all. Um, with forwards, you wanna consider the entire email chain. So uh, who are you forwarding it to? What type of information is included throughout the entire chain? And is it appropriate to send out to anybody? So I have seen people email, forward emails that have sensitive student data um, included throughout the chain or sensitive financial information. And then it's like quick trying to recall it. So really be very intentional about who you're forwarding emails to and what's actually included. Um, you really wanna consider it. Uh, with replying, you want to reply to every single email that you receive. Now, massive distribution lists, maybe not if they're just email updates, but um, every person who you receive an email from, you want to reply. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't have an immediate answer for their request, so maybe they ask you to review a proposal and you don't have time right now, and you might not have time for the next week, but you still wanna send that reply of, thank you so much, I will take a look at this and get this back to you by Friday or provide a timeline for them so that they know that you have received their email and that you will get back to them. You're not just ignoring them. I mean, if you think about it, when you send an email, you feel like you get ghosted if somebody's not replying to you or you're sitting there wondering, oh, did they get my email? Did it not go through? Did they not see it? Is it in their junk mail? So it's just kind of seen as rude if you don't reply. Um, and just think about how you would feel if, if you didn't get a reply for your emails. 
I do want to add something to this. Um, sometimes you may get an email from someone and a box will say this person wants you to uh, click OK to make sure that they, they see that you've received the email. So those red receipts um, boxes. You can go ahead. Um, I always say, yes, please let them know that I've read the email and I'll respond right away. Sometimes if they don't see that, it may, especially if you're pitching a business or seeking investors, they may say, okay, what are you hiding? So every action that you have can have, um, you know, depending on where the person's sitting, they may view it from a different perspective. So you just want to make sure and be aware of the perspectives that you're sending, whether it's online or in person or via phone. So I think that this is a big one. Um, I see this a lot with students, but when you're requesting a meeting from somebody, don't just ask if they're available to set up a meeting. Provide times when you're available to give them options for the meeting time. Um, this cuts down on the back and forth, but it also is respectful, right? Can we please meet? I'm available at this time. Please let me know if you are available at any of these times. If not, let me know when it's better and we can, we can work from there. But it's really, really difficult and I think frustrating when you get an email asking to set up a time to meet and then you don't tell me what time you're actually available. So then we're going back and forth. Well, I'm available Tuesday 2 to 4. Ooh, I'm not available at that time. Are you available Thursday 11 to 1? No, I'm not. How about Friday? Right? You're already getting that and I'm just saying that this isn't even an email going back and forth. So um, just something you want to consider, especially if it's you requesting something of somebody who maybe is in a higher position than you or who is going to invest in your company, a boss, something like that. It's really important. And again, it's showing that respect and that professionalism that you have for the person that you're um, emailing. Okay, general etiquette. So general phone etiquette. How many of you have spoken on the phone in the last 24 hours? Okay, half the room maybe. So this is, um, I'm seeing that this etiquette is dwindling as more people just revert to text message or group me's or slacks throughout um, you know, your general communication. Your phone etiquette is crucial because sometimes you'll have conference calls and we'll go through that in the next slide. But general phone etiquette, when you pick up your phone, making sure you say who you are. Hi, this is Janine. Hi, this is Allison. Um, usually everyone has their own cell phone, but if you have a company line or you know, um, you're know you using a general phone line, making sure that you're identifying yourself. When you're on a phone call, avoid excessive noise. So eating, drinking, maybe if there's music in the background, turn off. If you're driving in the car and you're bl Bluetooth, Probably avoid honking your horn, um, turning down your Spotify or radio. Um, and if you put, decide to put someone on hold, maybe you're looking for financials or you want to um, you know, get a question um, answered from your team or your coworker, letting, them, letting the person know, can I put you on hold for 30 seconds or for a little bit? And just be mindful of the wait time that you're putting them on hold for. If you use speakerphone, making sure that you're also letting that person be aware that I'm going to put you on speakerphone or when you answer your phone saying, hi Seth, um, I'm putting on your speaker, I'm putting on you on speakerphone, Allison's also in the room. So they don't disclose any sensitive data that maybe they want to um, say. And making sure your cell phone is silent or turned off during meetings. I know most of us usually just put it on vibrate, but that can also seem, if you're in a really important meeting, with a million dollars of funding on the line. You don't want to get to that financial statement and all of a sudden someone's <laughs> phone's buzzing and then no one wants to answer that phone. It's just buzzing and buzzing and buzzing and you're trying to go over the startup costs. You're trying to go over your expenses and there's just a buzzing on the background. And then people lose sight and lose focus on you know, the important aspects of your presentation because they're so focused on that buzzing. So making sure it's completely turned off. If, for example, um, you're going to an important meeting, but maybe a personal matter has come up and you're waiting to hear um, an urgent message, just let the person know, um, or the people in the room know, I'm waiting on a phone call um, regarding you know, a family member, so I'll have to excuse myself and during the meeting if that comes up. And they'll understand. Um, people are flexible, but people just don't want to get caught off guard. 
So how many of you have been, have you been on conference calls before? Yeah, a couple. Um, so this is something that you're definitely going to want to consider as you're moving into your career because conference calls are a necessity. First, uh, and Janine kind of mentioned this too, it's basically like speakerphone. If you're in the room with anybody else, make sure that you're introducing everybody who's in the room. So you might be calling in individually to a conference call. You could be in a, a room with 15 people and they should know everybody who's on the call. And it, again, it's for that disclosure of uh, potentially sensitive information, it could change the dialogue that's occurring based on who's in the room. Um, something with conference calls is it may seem uncomfortable or awkward if you're not comfortable with silence, but you do need to be okay with some silence because you need to consider people may be taking notes or they may be thinking about how they're going to respond and, and you don't get that in-person um, back and forth or you know, the actual just nonverbal communication, right? It's all through the phone, so you have to be okay with some pauses. And then because there can be multiple people, there will be multiple people on a conference call, um, direct any questions or statements to a person specifically. So use names so that it's not confusing and it's not just an open question. And often um, when you just ask an open question to anybody, uh, nobody answers because they don't know who you're directing it to, they don't wanna speak up in front of 20 plus people, so really direct those questions. And when the call is over, if you're responsible or not, uh, if you're facilitating the call or not, make sure that you end it clearly. Uh, it's really easy to awkwardly end conference calls, and I think we've all done it, where it's like, oh, oh okay, I guess we're done now, see ya. Um, but you wanna, you wanna make sure that it's clear that it's done, thank everybody for their time. You might wanna do a recap of action items that have come up on the call, and then hang up. Okay, great, dining. How many of you have gone on meals with potential investors or team members or employers just yet? Okay, a few. And how was that experience? Good, could you wish you would have known a little bit more before going? Yeah, so it varies. And going back to the generations, if you're having meals with a traditionalist, someone who is really looking that you don't put salt before you taste your food, um, this is the time where you just want to be more conservative and more prepared, because you may be at a table with, again, five different generations, but you want to cater to all of them. So being conservative and making sure that you have good dining etiquette and manners will be a better, um, reflection of you in general, rather than just like, oh, I don't, I don't care about those two baby boomers. They're not gonna matter when really, they're the ones making the final decision at the end. So you wanna take your whole audience into perspective. So before the meal, be on time. Um, hopefully that is courtesy to all of you and um, common sense all of you that you wanna be there at least 10 to 15 minutes on time. And this is, I'm going through this very traditionally but you may see some people who maybe are running late or maybe sit down before the host sit down, but we wanna make sure that we're covering all the bases so that you're fully prepared and that if someone does make a mistake, it's not you. Um, so you wanna wait for the host to sit down and indi if, to indicate the seating arrangement. Maybe it's just open seating, which sometimes it's most of it, but if you're unsure, just observe. Observe the senior people, observe your other coworkers, observe your team. When you sit down, usually there's napkins on the table. You want to make sure you're placing that on your lap. Um, and decide on your menu quickly. So when the waiter comes, you know what you want to get. And as far as your meal choice, getting something that is easy to eat and also because you're here for the conversation. So you want to make sure you're getting something easy to eat and something that um, you can finish and it's not overwhelming. Um, never order the most expensive item on the list, especially if you're in... If, if I'm an investor and I find a student comes up or they have a business and their startup cost is 500,000 and we're at a really nice restaurant and they order the most expensive thing on the menu, how are you gonna spend my money? Are you gonna spend it on the research and development that you need to or are you gonna throw parties and splurge on food and drinks? So that's something to be aware of, which sometimes you may not be. You just wanna, you're, you wanna take advantage of this really nice location and you wanna go for the champagne, you wanna go for the steak. But I'm an investor, how are you gonna spend my money? And don't order sloppy food or finger food and just have good etiquette in general, so no elbows on the table, no reaching over. 
for the salt or sugar or anything, because that is also a reflection of how you're going to be representing your services or your product. Or maybe there's other investors out there, or your sales or customers. How are you going to? Are you going to be? Oh, I have this. I have this one prototype here. Oh, my prototype's over there. So you just want to be as organized as possible, and your dining etiquette will showcase that that's a reflection of you. And lastly, hopefully you've, we've already covered this and you're getting this um, trend, but don't be on your phone. Also, just turn it off, put on Do Not Disturb. We don't want that um, vibrating noise as everyone is ordering and everyone's quiet and all of a sudden you hear that buzzing noise again. And whose phone is that? And everyone's looking around and then they find out it's you. Mm -hmm. And everyone just tries to ignore you, but they know it's you. So just turn it off and leave it off the table. During the meal, um, you want to make sure everyone has their food before you start eating. And usually the host will eat first. Maybe sometimes they'll stand up and give a toast um, and then you can go and eat. But just be aware of that and if you're unsure, again, observe the rest of the table. Eating with soup, so this may be um, something that you may encounter. If you're eating with soup and let's, let's say you're in a nice outfit, you want to scoop away. So. I wish we had a spoon and soup here, but you want to scoop away so that if anything does happen, nothing comes up um, and hits your tie or shirt. And then making sure, and we, we're going to show you the place settings, but when you put your utensils down, you're resting it on a platter or a saucer and not the table. So you're keeping the tablecloth clean um, and neat. I always, uh, when I go out to nice dinners and you're with a table, whoever has the bread in front of them or the butter in front of them, you always offer it to the person to your left first and then pass it to your right and go forth and so forth. Um, and just make sure when w waiters come around you're understanding where they are so they're always serving from the left and clean up from the right but if they're reaching over you be respectful and just move. I always say thank you to the waiter to show that you're uh, courteous and, and polite. So this is an informal setting. Most dinners will have this, but if you're unsure, if you have multiple forks, multiple spoons, you want to always work your way from the outside in. And then you have your drinks. I always, so picture your dinner in front of you. If you're confused about which drink is yours, use your two, your two hands. Bread is for B, D is for drinks. And that's how you know which setting is yours. Yep. So it's a little trick and it's a, trick. It's a really good trick. I, I still use it, and I'm years Me out. <laughs> At weddings? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so during the meal, make sure that you're cutting appropriately, prongs down. Um, you want to rest your knife and fork on the plate. I mean, you know, five and seven o'clock. Um, and put your um, cutlery down when you're actually speaking. And that is just um, kind of showing respect for the people that you're speaking with. You don't want to be shoveling food into your mouth as you're talking and you're chewing with your mouth open and it's just unappealing and people don't want to chat that way. So um, just be respectful and, and considerate with that. So this is a more formal setting. So maybe when you're really trying to woo some baby boomers or traditionalists, you may take them to a really nice restaurant. And it's a bit overwhelming. Um, but that's okay, because now you're equipped with your B and your D, and you know to work outside in. Your napkin will be on your lap. And then I always, so I'm going to cover some of this. If you're underage, don't order alcohol. Hopefully everyone knows that. Um, even if you see other people or they're offering you, you never know if it's a test. So respecting the law, respecting um, who you're with, if they offer you alcohol, you can just respectfully decline. Um, making sure that if you're in a restaurant, you have your dessert spoon and cake fork there. If no one else orders dessert, you don't want to be like, actually, I want chocolate mousse, or I w I'd like a creme brulee. Um, you want to go with the flow of the conversation of the host and whoever the most senior person is there. So really, just again, the purpose of you being at this dinner or lunch is for the conversation. It's for the networking. It's not for the food. So keep that in mind. I mean, yes, we want you to eat. We don't want you to starve. But um, 
you want to consider throughout the entire meal that you are there to converse with the people who are there and that again they're taking in everything that you're saying that you're doing how you're representing yourself at this meal um, so you want to consider it be relaxed be conversational again don't be solely um, directed to your food you want to consider the people um, don't take things too personally, to a personal level, which can be easier when you're at a meal because it seems less formal than a business conversation that you may be having or an interview or a presentation, something like that, but you're still in that professional mindset, right? So you don't wanna get so informal that you get too personal. Um, so think about that. And then again, with the food, make sure that you're maintaining eye contact. Don't be staring at your food, even though you may want to really, really eat that steak, I don't know. Um, you want to be looking at the people because again it's about the people it's not about the steak and you can create group conversations you can create individual conversations if you notice that maybe somebody's not as involved it would be really good of you to get them involved somehow and, and get everybody involved in the conversation get to know more about everybody who's at the table and then after the meal um, to indicate that you're done eating, you put the knife and fork with the prong side down so that they, uh, they know that they can clean up your food. Um, and then, again, you kind of go dessert-wise with the host. So if they're getting dessert or if they order dessert, there's an expectation that get it. And then you don't have to eat the whole thing if you don't want it, but you go with the flow of the meal and, and the direction of the host. When you're done with everything, you can put your napkin to the left of your plate don't argue over the check. So this can be easy. You can potentially offer to pay, but if the host says, no, no, this is on me, don't push too much. Um, and that's a formal, that's just formal etiquette. You don't want to push too, too much. And then thank them for the meal at the end or whoever's paying for the meal, make sure you thank them. And that's really important because they're paying attention. They're paying attention to everything that you're doing during this meal. And again, it's kind of just showing who you are and who you're going to be, not only as a person, but in business. And um, these seem like small details, but it's they're important. Okay, networking. So how do you meet these people that will um, invest in your company? Maybe you're in your early stages of developing your business, but you realize, I really need to develop my website and you need that skill set. Um, where do you go? Who, and you know, what are you looking for? So the easiest way to network is usually at large events or maybe meetings that people bring you into, even in your classroom. We host a lot of events in the Career Center, um, but these are places you can meet people. But the first thing you wanna do is prepare. So if there's a guest list, making sure that you're reviewing it and having your target people that you want to speak to. Um, what are your goals there? Do you want to set up meetings or set up conversations? Do you want to get that business card of that one angel investor that will be there? Plan on safe topic conversations so you don't want to go in blind. If it's an engineering um, biomedical event, then maybe you should read up on a few um, journals or research that have, that have just come up. Um, and actively listen. And we're going to go through an activity of active listening because uh, it, it really helps to know what your, um, where your conversation is going and learning about that person that you're speaking to. Bring lots of business cards. Um, if you don't have business cards, make sure you're asking for business cards or you're asking for that email phone number to connect with. Um, if you're at a, usually networking events are large, you know, maybe there's a few tables, people are talking. If you see someone standing alone, um, that's a good time to speak with someone or speak to them, approach them who are alone. If you're alone and you're uncomfortable and you're like, I don't know how to start, go to that one person that's alone. Maybe I see Allison standing in the corner and be like, hi, Allison, my name's Janine. Um, what brings you to this event? That's a really good question to ask. What brings you to this event if you don't know who that person is? And comment before leaving a group. So what I mean by this, if Allison and I are talking and Seth comes on up, um, so we're all in the group and I see Carla Khan walking by. Now he's a really big banker, has a lot of money. I don't want to just leave them. I can say, excuse me, I saw someone that I wanted to speak to. It was really great meeting both of you. And I hope to catch you um, later on at the event. And just dismiss yourself politely. 
Has anyone ever been in those situations where you feel like you're stuck talking to a group and you don't know how to dismiss yourself? Yes. So you, another um, little trick that I try to use is, it was really nice meeting you. I promised myself that I talked to five uh, new people today. Um, so it was great. Can we exchange business cards and say thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your event and then go on your merry way. The one thing that I really advise people against is saying, oh, I have to refresh my drink, and then you walk, and you're not even going towards the bar, or you're not even going towards food. Um, so it just looks like you are trying to do a cop out. So you want to make sure you're also dismissing yourself nicely as much as you are introducing yourself. OK, so we're going to do an active listening activity. Um, so what we're going to do is you're going to pair up, and one of you will be the talker, and one of you will be the listener, and we'll switch so it doesn't matter who's who. But the talker will describe a place that, uh, what you want from vacation or from a holiday. So picture your dream vacation, your dream holiday for the summer. But don't say the place that you're thinking about. And we're going to do that for about three minutes. Just describe your dream vacation um, to your listener. And then afterwards, the listener will recommend a place for you. To, to go. So we'll pair up the talker. If you have a destination place in mind, your dream holiday, go ahead and start explaining that to the person and what you want from a holiday. And I was also thinking, like, would you how long I would be their family, like, they love me, like, I want to be like, so I want to, like, like, my other vacation, they were like, so maybe Okay, does anyone want to share a group, share their their conversation? You want to share? So Ryan um, proposed he wanted to go um, somewhere that was cold, but not too cold. You know, below 40 was a little bit too much. But he wanted to enjoy the mountains, and um, he wanted to go skiing and snowmobiling. Um, you know, possibly bringing ski lifts and things around. You know, um, no cell reception, so it's very secluded and very much you know with the people that he was with. He would like to um, go with his friends because you know family trips can sometimes be a little too much. Um, but, you know, I exactly, just kind of, you know, being with his friends, enjoying the snow, enjoying the, the fun activities uh, around there. Awesome. So well, where did you recommend? I recommended that he went to, like, Utah or Vermont. Did you have a place in mind? Uh, I actually thought Utah, so that was the wow. yeah. So you're really great at explaining and you really listened really <laughs> yeah. well. So this is, this is the type of active listening skills that you want to um, practice during your conversations with investors or teammates. So we're going to switch. Um, so whoever was the talker first, listen. And the listener just, we're going to shorten it to just a minute and a half. But the listener just listen and um, absorb. And then we'll have a conversation after that minute and a half. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. So seems like most people have finished their conversations, but do we have any groups that want to share? We were discussing uh, what he would want to do for vacation, and he was talking about like mountain area, um, wilderness uh, included in it. Um, he wants to go in a minivan and just like go down. <laughs> so um, I started off talking about like Washington State because I thought that would be like a good place, that area right there. But he was thinking like, no, no, you gotta go like down more. So I was like, all right, let's go to South America. So I was thinking Chile because like they have a huge mountain range. But then he had this, um, he had like a, this specific place in Argentina in mind. And so like, yeah, we kind of got it right. I kind of got it right, but like I didn't yeah. know that. So yeah, it was pretty close. Yeah. But that's great. You actively ask questions as well, um, which will you'll also need when you're directing conversation. So um, just something to consider when you are networking is if you're with somebody else. So maybe Janine and I come to an event together and I know everybody at the event. Um, I don't want to just leave Janine in the dust. I don't want to have her standing there awkwardly while I'm having conversations with everybody else. I'm going to introduce her to everybody. 
Uh, now, there may be some people whose names I do not remember. And in that case, don't pretend. Just own up to it. Say, Janine, this is, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Maybe not in that way, but um, <laughs> you, can, you can politely ask. You can politely ask. I'm really sorry I forget your name. Um, this is my colleague, Janine. Um, and then you can introduce each other. I don't know if you have a different way of doing that, but. Yeah. There's another tip where um, if you're to get, if you're, let's say you're here with your business partner and you totally forgot someone's name, I always introduce, um, this is Allison, and then Allison will go shake that person. Yeah. She'll introduce yourself, and then the person will introduce their yeah. name, and you're like, you don't they'll never know that you didn't remember their name. Yeah. Yep. Um, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's, that's a good trick, too. Name. That's what I would do. Um, but if you are going to introduce somebody, make sure you say a little something, not just this is Janine and then continue the conversation. This is my colleague Janine. She's also a career advisor. Um, and then you can go from there. So say a little bit something. Um, if somebody, so say we go together and I'm the one on the outskirts and Janine forgets to introduce me, um, I should not just stand there awkwardly listening, I should take the initiative. So if, if, somebody, if you're with somebody and they don't introduce you, take the initiative and introduce yourself. Or even if you see somebody, again, I know Janine mentioned this earlier, but if you see somebody standing alone, you can go up and again, take the initiative, go introduce yourself, start a conversation, because you never know who that person is and you never know where that conversation could lead. Um, and again, bring your business cards or ask for business cards so that you're exchanging information with everybody that you speak with. Um, and can contact them afterwards, and then you have that connection, um, which is the point of networking. So, I mean, I, we want to leave you with one last thing and something that we continue to observe, but people forget to introduce themselves. N I think one person said their name. So you want to make sure you say, hi, my name is Seth, hi, my name is Dan, um, I'm a sophomore, my company is Duck Systems. And thank you so much for your presentation. I'd like to share the experience that we had right here. Um, so don't forget to introduce yourself as well, because you are just as important. You came here, you made the effort. So we want to know who you are, and we want to also make sure that you're, you're proud of the, you know, where you've come from. So this is our just last slide, and hopefully everyone knows who Mark Cuban is. But we just wanted to leave you with a nice picture towards the sunset. So it's really not the dreaming that makes you, but it's the doing. So no matter what, just make sure to get out there and do it. You have so many resources here, Adrian, the Career Center, your peers. Um, so if you ever feel at a loss and you feel like you're daydreaming and you need a kick, we're here. So thank you so much for being here, and it was really great. Yeah, thank you.